In the last week, I've been spending a lot of time with the Ryzen 7 9800X3D, and more in particular, trying to extract extra performance out of this CPU, because this time around, with the 9800X3D, AMD have allowed it so that you can actually overclock the CPU's core frequency over that of the base levels. For instance, in previous Ryzen 7 7800X3D or 5700X3D CPU configurations, you couldn't really do anything with the CPU outside of the curve optimizer in terms of positive or negative voltage levels. And so this really didn't change the speed a whole lot because it would just still run at the base max that AMD set on those CPUs. However, this time around, we can unlock this via two different methods. And though up until this point, you may already be thinking, wow, that makes the 9800X3D automatically just that much better, right? And the answer is kind of nuanced in that, yes, you can overclock, but do you really want to overclock? However, let's answer all those questions as well as an update on the Cyberpunk 2077 results right after today's video sponsor. If you want to get rid of this annoying activate Windows message, then today's video sponsor SCD Keys has you covered for as little as 15 US dollars. After you enter that coupon code BFTYC, you can cop yourself a legit single end user license today. Also works for Windows 11 Pro 2. Links in the description below. Welcome back to Tech Yes City. Now, in today's video, we're gonna go into the BIOS and we're gonna be doing two different methods of overclocking with the 9800X3D. The first method is the AMD recommended settings. Now, how you do this is you go into the Precision Boost Overdrive settings within the BIOS and then you put in a multiplier that's positive on the scalar and this can be 1x up to 10x and AMD for some reason they recommended 7 to 10x and I'm going to talk about this a little bit later more in depth and just caution you guys about going really anything above uh, 2x because this is a multiplier and it does apply to voltages and because I haven't tested the CPU out for longevity purposes on these settings, I can't tell you if this is going to be safe. Generally, when I recommend settings, especially with overclocking, I like to make sure that my viewers are at least getting a safe experience and they're not gonna wreck their computer in any way, shape or form. Because also when it comes to warranty, AMD doesn't guarantee anything when it comes to overclocking. If they've found out you've been overclocking the system, they can reject the warranty claim, even if the CPU did fail within the three year warranty period. The back to these overclock settings here, we set a 7X scale and then we put a 200 positive boost on the CPU clock speeds. And so what this means is that the max CPU speeds now will go up 200 megahertz above the 5,225 megahertz that we were getting in our initial review when we were testing the games side by side against the 7800X3D. Also, we did apply a negative curve offset here because I like the CPU running cooler with less voltage at least versus the AMD levels that they've set out of the box for this particular CPU with the tables. And because we've got a really good cooler, a 420 mil Arctic water cooler, as well as a really good motherboard, a B650 Taichi motherboard, and on top of that, a platinum rated power supply, we should be okay to get around this by using more fine tuned settings because our gear is really good to start with. But then there's the second method. And actually for me personally, this is my preferred method because I find the amps is the only scalar left in the equation. The frequencies don't drop when it's in idle as well as the voltage just stays static. But also I find the system is just that little bit more responsive, especially with Ryzen 9000. Though here's where we can set in a 5,425 megahertz setting for games. And we'll again talk about this a little bit later. I did manage in one benchmark to get 5,600 megahertz working. And we'll talk about that in the age of mythology uh, benchmarks. But really there's no option here to scale down the clock speeds when it comes to utilizing different instruction sets. And this is important because it's gonna make it that the CPU is just utilizing more power and it can't run at higher clock speeds in relation to using certain instruction sets. Whereas opposed to on other instruction sets, it could be running higher because they're not as demanding in terms of power usage as the other instruction sets. <laughs> So if you're confused at this point, don't worry. We're gonna get onto the gaming benchmarks right after we talk about the last setting that we're gonna be testing here. This is in the Gigabyte BIOS on the Aorus motherboard, and that's the X3D Turbo mode. Now, I already tested this out in my original review, but Gigabyte really wanted me to focus on this and talk about it and make separate charts for it because they were really proud of this X3D Turbo setting. So with that out of the way, let the benchmarks begin. And here's where we're gonna show the first and most interesting benchmark of all, Age of Mythology, because this showed in the original review actually quite a big difference 
between the 7800X3D and the 9800X3D. And here is where the 9800X3D, once we decide to overclock this to 5.6 gigahertz, it actually screamed ahead, getting over 210 average FPS. It was actually crazy to see, but the 0.1% lows were the worst out of all the four results for the 9800X3D. And if we look at the PBO setting of over 5.4 gigahertz here, we can see that that's actually coming close to the out of the box settings that we already got in our review, as well as that of the X3D Turbo, which isn't doing a whole lot in this benchmark. But this is kind of a weird result because we can clearly see that the 5.6 gigahertz is doing something in particular with this game. And so it's liking the higher clock speeds, especially if we cross-reference that back with our original review where the 9950X was actually doing extremely well in this benchmark. And lo and behold, that actually had some of the highest clock speeds. So this benchmark definitely does like the clock speeds, but our 5.425 gigahertz uh, clock setting here isn't doing that well. So onto the next benchmark here, Far Cry 6. Here is where we had to then dial down our overclock settings to lo and behold 5.425 gigahertz, exactly that of the Precision Boost Overdrive settings. However, the manual settings did pull off a 326, so it was like two FPS higher than that of the original 324 that we got. The X3D Turbo mode scored roughly the same, and then our uh, Precision Boost Overdrive actually scored a few FPS less than that of the original settings. So this Precision Boost Overdrive with 200 plus megahertz isn't doing a whole lot. And in fact, I feel like it's overloading the CPU in other portions in terms of the power budget because that X3D cache does get quite hot. The more of this stuff you have, the hotter the CPU is gonna get. I feel like having these clock speeds just dialed in off a random Precision Boost Overdrive isn't doing the best when it comes to gaming. Though, let's move on now to the next result, Baldur's Gate 3. And there really was nothing to see here actually across all four levels of the testing. So this uh, game clearly loves that 3D cache and it's not really doing a whole lot in terms of gaining extra FPS. So now we're moving on to Cyberpunk 2077. And in the comments section, you guys in the previous review, some of you critiqued my numbers on the 9800X3D saying that they should have been much higher than the 7800X3D. And also I then got sort of like abused on Twitter by people <laughs> calling me names and stuff like that. And automatically, if someone doesn't look at facts straight away, I'm gonna address the people who are calling me names. If you don't look at the actual data itself and you just resort to name calling, it doesn't speak much for your intelligence, that's for sure. But anyhow, I decided to look at other people's results in relation to this benchmark. And also I could see was other people were testing on either different parts of the map that they weren't specifically showing, and then they were just showing a benchmark chart, which I cannot ascertain anything from those numbers. All I can ascertain is that someone's put numbers in a spreadsheet and the sources trust me bro. But I did find another YouTube channel called Gear Seekers. They tested at 1080p on low settings with what looked like the inbuilt benchmark, which is exactly what I was using on high settings. So I decided to change it to 1080p low settings just to cross reference with another YouTuber's results. And here is where out of the box with the polling software on, and this is actually quite important, we got our polling software on, we're getting pretty much identical results for the 9800X3D in this particular uh, benchmark. But then if we look at the 7800X3D, you'll find it's performing actually better than the 9800X3D in this particular benchmark on low settings with an RTX 4090. Now overclocking this with the 9800X3D, it did do a little bit better, as well as the X3D Turbo. But back to these results, if you guys are questioning my results on the 9800X3D, I think it's the wrong thing to look at here. I think the right question would be to ask is why are other YouTubers results so low for the 7800X3D, especially in Cyberpunk 2077? Because continuing on with this, there's absolutely zero bias from my corner as to why I would prefer to have the 7800X3D running faster. I don't use the CPU in any of my personal rigs. In fact, I've got a bias towards the 9800X3D and that I wanna put it in one of my main rigs and start testing it after the heap of benchmark that we're doing here to see if it could be the main placeholder as the CPU that I use in my main rig. However, I look at Gear Seekers numbers here and I do apologize, I do like Gear Seekers a lot, but it was the only results that I could cross reference with. And here's what they were getting with the 7800X3D and Cyberpunk on 1080p low settings in the 250 region. Now, also when I asked AMD about the Cyberpunk numbers, they actually admitted to me that Cyberpunk was performing pretty much identical with the 9800X3D and the 7800X3D 
at 1080p high settings, which is exactly what we were showing, well, maybe one FPS higher towards the 7800X3D, but that was all in uh, margin of variance. But when we stepped it down to low settings, we could see that the 7800X3D actually started to do better. Now, if you want to turn off the polling software completely, sure, we can get a 298 average FPS figure on stock settings on the 9800X3D, but we can also do the same for the 7800X3D. What I like to do here at Tech City is compare things apples to apples and then just show you guys a result that you can be confident in and say, hey, I'm making the best decision, especially to what I'm outlaying in terms of money. Now, if you're playing Cyberpunk all day, every day, from my results, at least here, it looks like the 7800X3D is gonna be better value than the 9800X3D. Though the final thing about Cyberpunk 2077 is I just show you guys the numbers, side-by-side -side footage, and also look at the average FPS for the settings that we're using. I actually find that they're quite high for what they are. I mean, getting close to 300 FPS on a 7800X3D, please, I'd like to see someone replicate that on their test bench, another reviewer. They're welcome to. The numbers are there. Please tell me my 7800X3D results are wrong. And until then, I'm not going to buy this whole 9800X3D is performing wildly better in Cyberpunk. Then move on to Gears 5, and here is where we're testing out the four different scenarios. And in all these scenarios, there wasn't really a big difference at all, this could come down to variance. So overclocking for this particular title did not really make a difference. It was more so 3D cache bound. And then moving on to the last title here, Hogwarts Legacy, 1080p high settings. We see that the manual overclock did score slightly better than the other four results here, but they're all very close to one another, just like the other games that we tested here with the exception of Age of Mythology, which was uh, absolutely screaming ahead and was very responsive to an overclock. Then now it's time to look at power consumption. If we overclock this CPU and we extract this extra performance, it's not really making a huge difference, especially when it comes to games. But if we decide to test out Cinebench, here's where things actually start to get a bit icky because this is definitely using the AVX2 instruction set and it's actually quite a heavy benchmark. And here's where we can see the power consumption does go up to around 153 watts direct draw. So it's over that of the base configuration. But also if we decide to then say, okay, this 200 megahertz precision boost overdrive setting is increasing the clock speeds really only up to around 5.29 gigahertz. That's what it's showing when we're running this benchmark. It's actually not giving us a whole lot more performance, especially versus either out of the box undervolted figure or, and here's where I'm going to actually suggest a very different uh, overclock for you guys rather than the recommended AMD one. Here's where I dialed in roughly a 75 megahertz precision boost overdrive setting with an undervolt of around 15 steps in the precision boost overdrive setting, a negative offset there. And I found with a 1x scaler, this performed actually the best in the Cinebench results. Here we can see we've got 23,365 and the power consumption is uh, still right around that 140 watt figure. So basically in a nutshell, we're now getting slightly extra performance and we're doing so with higher scores than that of the out of the box settings. So basically when it comes to safe settings and what I can recommend, at least from my own testing, I would say stick to either the default settings, lock in your Expo profiles, do some slight tuning in the BIOS, or you can go with what we're recommending here today, just a 75 megahertz boost there with a 1X scaler and a negative offset of around 15. Found that there was a really good sweet spot for this CPU and the Cinebench results uh, just show that ever so slightly in terms of a slight tune. And now with all that talk and all those numbers out of the way, it's time to give you guys a conclusion in relation to overclocking and the Ryzen 7 9800X3D. And basically what we saw with those graphs was in a lot of titles, it's not going to make a difference. And also when it does make a difference, you're going to come into instability issues and it's not worth the time and hassle to even bother with overclocking this CPU. However, on the flip side, undervolting, that may be worth it. I'm going to check that out a little bit more in depth in the next few days and then make a video on undervolting the 9800X3D because perhaps we can drop off couple of hundred megahertz still get very similar performance, but especially at 1080p high FPS gaming, we may be able to increase that efficiency and even match that of the 7800X3D, which at least in the testing we did in the original review, 7800X3D was actually performing a bit better in terms of efficiency 
versus the 9800X3D. And also on that note of power consumption and efficiency, overclocking didn't really make a whole lot of a difference. But then again, when it came to the game that we tested the power consumption in, and that was for uh, Baldur's Gate 3, the FPS was pretty much the same. <laughs> Anyhow, regardless of the mode that we were overclocking with, Though, the final thing to talk about was Age of Mythology. There we got a actual real big difference when it came to overclocking and the power consumption was slightly higher for that game. But it was nothing in the realm of, wow, this is so inefficient. So there is some potential cases for overclocking with the 9800X3D. So if you're a competitive gamer and you want to use the 9800X3D, perhaps look at the game that you play and if you really need to extract the max FPS, then you can delve into the world of going into the boss and trying to configure a few settings to unlock some extra FPS if you wish to. Just keep in mind that it then might be unstable in other games at those particular settings as we witnessed with Age of Mythology, which is kind of a game that was remade from the early 2000s. So it's probably using very similar instruction sets and things which are outdated by modern day standards. But also the final thing is when it comes to looking at these results that I'm showing you here today and then validating them, especially against other YouTubers, when it comes to that kind of stuff, guys, I really need to know what settings, resolution, and the part of the map that particular person tested on. Otherwise, to me, it's just numbers on a spreadsheet and it doesn't have any bearing. I can't cross-reference that if I don't know where that particular person tested on and I'm just getting a bar graph. It means nothing to me and I cannot do anything with that other than, hey, this person just put numbers in a spreadsheet. Because when we break it down, I know it might be a bit hypercritical, but that's really what it is. And <laughs> after all this crap that's gone on in the last few years, I've definitely been getting a lot uh, more hypercritical of everything in life. And I implore you guys to do the same in the comment section. I actually appreciate it. I feel like you guys are very harsh on me in the comments, but for good reason, right? If we're not criticizing them in ways we're not trying to improve ourselves as a community and strive for the best results or the best uh, feedback that would improve innovation of said products and whatnot. Anyhow, guys, with all that aside, I hope you enjoyed this one. If you did, then you know what to do with that like button and the sub button, and I'll catch you in another tech video very soon. Peace out for now. Bye.